polarization in the in the United States these days is as bad as it's been for a long, long time. It does uh, weaken us both internally and externally, right? It's hard to it's hard to get democracy to work properly when we're so divided internally, and it makes it easier for external adversaries to sort of exploit those divisions uh, to intervene in our politics. Hello and welcome back to a new season of Cambridge Forum coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, Executive Director, and we're excited to be here and to have lined up a wide range of programmes for you in the coming weeks. We start today by examining a pernicious but escalating issue which threatens American democracy as surely as any physical invasion. I speak of the serious information warfare being waged on democracy by China and Russia, largely on social media, which is coupled with our own homegrown attacks on democracy, which are ravaging the infrastructure from within. Both are combining to lethal effect to undermine and weaken democracy both in America and around the world. David Sloss is a national security expert who worked for the US government for nine years as a US Soviet arms control negotiator before entering academia. He's now a distinguished law professor at Santa Clara University and author of Tyrants on Twitter. In his latest book, he provides evidence to support the very real threat he believes Russia and China are posing to the structure of democracy globally. This well-funded campaign, coupled with our own engine of manufactured falsehoods and fatuous information, which is being churned out daily by social and mainstream media, is chipping away at the foundations of our belief in journalism and in our political system. What's the overall result? Well, an increase in the rise of autocracies and a decline in democracies around the world, creating a new and unsettling shift in the world order, unparalleled since the Cold War. Well, to help us understand the global picture, we are pleased to welcome John Pfeffer, our second speaker, who's Director of Foreign Policy in Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies. He's also the author of Right Across the World, The Global Networking of the Far Right and the Left Response, and a former associate editor of World Policy Journal. So welcome to you both, John and David. Thank you. So let me start first with you, David. So you finished your book, Tyrants on Twitter, which is conveniently displayed behind you there. <laughs> right. um, in November of 2020. Um, what motivated you first to write the book? And then, of course, a lot of things happened between writing it and publishing it in the world. Uh, so tell me why you had to write a new preface. <laughs> OK, so uh, I really got interested in the topic when revelations first came out about uh, Russian interference in the 2016 election in the United States. So when I started on the book, I was really focused about Russian interference in the US election. But as I dug into the topic, uh, I broadened the scope because I learned that Russia has been interfering in elections all over Europe too. So I have a chapter on that. Uh, and China is actively engaged in uh, information warfare. So I have a chapter also about uh, China. Uh, and I really wanted to uh, look at potential solutions. So the second half of the book is really focused on what do we do to uh, what do we do to address this problem. Uh, and as you mentioned, I I sent the uh, original manuscript to the publisher in November 2020, right around uh, election day, and and the publisher sent it out for outside comments. And by the time I got those outside comments back, January 6 had happened, uh, and so. Uh, I, a lot of the outside commentators were like, well, you're focused here on foreign threats. What about domestic problems? So I wrote a short preface that sort of addresses the linkage between domestic threats to democracy and foreign threats to democracy, which I think are very related, but I think require different kinds of solutions. So you speak about information warfare. Um, why is this so urgent to you? Why does it seem so pervasive and what actually do you mean by that term? Okay, so uh, information warfare is sort of a subset of a broader class of activities which I refer to as 
foreign, inf uh, uh, foreign influence operations. Foreign influence operations have been going on for a long time. States have been doing this kind of thing for a long time. But modern digital technology puts a whole new spin on foreign influence operations. So states and political parties are now using digital technology for uh, you know, manipulating information and they do it domestically. But when I talk about information warfare, I'm really talking about using that uh, social media manipulation to conduct foreign influence operations. And social media specifically in the internet or digital technology more broadly, allows for much, much more sophisticated types of foreign influence operations. So just to give one example, one of the things that, were, that the Russians were doing during the 2016 election where they were setting up these fake accounts where Russians posed as Americans. And to the average sort of social media user, they thought they were uh, interacting with other Americans on social media. And they would do this and target particular demographics. So they'd set up an account where somebody's pretending to be an African-American to try and influence the African-American vote. Or they're pretending to be a gun lover to try to influence that vote, right? Uh, and social media allows them to disguise themselves with these fake identities. And that's a very effective way to sort of influence people if they, if the people seeing your posts think, oh, you're like me, as opposed to if we know, oh, that's a Russian agent, we would respond very differently. And, and what kind of money do you know if they're spending on this kind of uh, infiltration? Is it a lot of money? Uh, so uh, the, the Russian operation was uh, run by the uh, Internet Research Agency, and they had a budget of about uh, $12 million a year for doing these kind of operations. Uh, that's dwarfed by the Chinese budget, which, and of course, we don't have great figures on the Chinese budget. It's secretive, but there are estimates saying that China is now spending something like $10 billion a year on foreign influence operations, which is a huge number, right? That's sort of uh, mind boggling. So you've got a couple of charts um, that you want to talk about in the book. One about the history of regimes, which back up the idea that you have been promulgating about the rise of autocracy and the demise of democracy. And the other one is about Chinese owned Facebook followers. So maybe you could talk us through those. Um... Great. Yeah, so uh, this chart, basically the um, yellow line represents the percentage of states in the world that are classified as autocracies. The green line is the percentage of states in the world that are classified as democracies. And we can see during the Cold War period from uh, 1973 up until about 1990, we had a slow but steady rise in the number of democracies, a slow but steady decline in the number of autocracies. Then with the end of the Cold War, war those uh, curves get a lot steeper. We got a pretty steep rise in the number of democracies starting in about 1990 and a correspondingly steep decline in the number of uh, autocracy so that the lines cross in about 2000. And starting just after 2000, we really have more democracies in the world than we did autocracies. And those uh, levels remain fairly stable for uh, almost 20 years, starting a little after 2000. But what we've seen recently, notice that between 2018 and 2021, the number of democracies declines, the number of autocracies goes up. And so now in 2021, for the first time since about 2000, we've actually got more autocracies in the world than we do democracies. And that recent rise in autocracies and decline in democracies is a troubling uh, trend. The blue line um, also, sort of, can, you, can you just differentiate what you mean there by a closed autocracy as opposed to just an autocracy? Well, uh, well, that's what I was just about to yeah. get to. So the, yeah. right, the blue line represents uh, closed autocracies. And so this is based on a categoriz categorization system by a group in Sweden called the Varieties of Democracy Institute. And they break regimes into four types, uh, but they distinguish between uh, electoral autocracies and closed autocracies. Closed autocracies are basically the most repressive regimes in the world. And we can see back in 1970, 
Three, more than 50% of the countries in the world were classified as closed autocracies. That number went steadily down, down, down until 2012, where it's only about 11% of the countries in the world are closed autocracies. So that was a very favorable trend for people who believe in democracies. We saw this long steady decline in the number of closed autocracies, but we hit bottom in 2012. And since then, that number has been uh, creeping back up. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty disturbing. And, I uh, believe, so it's very hard to prove a sort of a causal connection between information warfare and these trends that are depicted in this graph. But I believe that information warfare is one of several factors that is contributing to the decline of democracy and the rise of autocracy that we're seeing in the last few years. Uh, and there's a lot of anecdotal information to support that claim. But as I said, it's really hard to make a strong causal claim about that. And then what about the Facebook followers? Right, so if we can go to the next slide. Uh, the next slide looks at uh, Chinese state media companies versus large Western media companies and how many followers they have on Facebook. And What's shocking here is that you've got these five large Chinese state media companies, all of which in one way or another is acting as agents of the Chinese Communist Party, and all of whom have more followers on Facebook than any of the biggest Western media companies, right? Mm. Uh, and it's important to note here that Facebook is essentially banned in China. So the bulk of these people who are basically getting information from Chinese media companies, uh, the ones depicted here on this graph or on this chart are uh, primarily people outside of China. These uh, Chinese media companies are broadcasting. I mean, this represents the different companies listed there represent um, television, radio, and newspaper, but they all publishing in a variety of different languages. China Daily in particular, uh, uh, is operating radio stations that are broadcasting in uh, some somewhere between 40 and 60 languages, depending upon uh, which uh, numbers you look at. So they're really reaching a global audience and they're reaching a global audience through not only through uh, television, radio and newspaper, they're reaching a global audience by using US social media companies like Facebook to help reach this global audience and essentially spread what is uh, propaganda of the Chinese Communist Party, and in some cases, a lot of uh, misinformation. So we've identified the problem that China and Russia are buying into the control of social media networks here. Then we have the additional problem of the flawed domestic information system we've got with disinformation silos, which are insisting the dismantling from our own democracy from within. And then we're assisting the promotion of autocracy by things like inviting Victor Orban to come and address the Republicans in Dallas last month. I mean, this is an extreme right wing government. Uh, we won't even go into the things he said because I don't want to give any airtime to him. But you say the US government, quote, has much greater leeway to regulate speech by foreign agents on US social media platforms than it does to regulate speech by US citizens on those same platforms. So can you explain the legal conundrum here? Yeah, well, the First Amendment protects the right of all Americans to speak. So putting limits on speech by Americans on social media runs into significant First Amendment hurdles. That mean, doesn't mean the government can't do anything, but the government is under tight constraints there. The Supreme Court has made clear that foreigners outside the United States are not protected by the First Amendment. That means we have a lot more leeway to restrict speech by foreigners outside the United States. Now, the Supreme Court has also said that we have a right to hear what those foreigners want to say, right? So the, we have to allow some ability for us to essentially receive information because the First Amendment protects not only the right to speak, but also the right to receive information. But in my view, uh, basically limiting their access to social media is consistent with First Amendment. When I say their access to social media, I'm referring particularly to 
uh, people are acting as agents of the Chinese government or the Russian government, right? Uh, I think basically it's okay to completely kick them off of social media, and I propose doing that. But remember, there are lots of other ways we can receive information from them because we can get information from Chinese and uh, Russian television stations, radio stations, newspapers, etc. So, so kicking them off of social media does not mean that we're unable to hear what they have to say because there are lots of other mechanisms out there. And the Supreme Court has this idea that if you want to shut down one channel of communication, it's okay if you leave open other channels of communication. Right? So that's uh, part of my basic proposal here is that I think we should ban Chinese and Russian state agents from social media platforms. Not everybody agrees that that's okay under the First Amendment, but I think it's certainly defensible under the First Amendment. Providing we can identify them, which is another whole issue. Um, yeah. So you speak of the useful idiot problem, which I wanted you to explain from a national security perspective, which works against this transnational regulatory system, which you're proposing. Uh, so can you explain the term and then your proposed suggestion at confronting? Yeah, them? so the term is actually a translation of a Russian term. <clears throat> and this has been a part, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the Russian. I can't tell you the Russian term. John may be able to help me there. I'm not sure. Uh, but, uh, but this has been a part of Russian doctrine and strategy for a long time, going back to Lenin, at least, and maybe even earlier, I'm not sure. Uh, but the idea is one way, if you want to conduct foreign influence operations in a way that's effective, what you do is find people within the system who are willing to essentially propagate your ideas. And so Russia has done this very effectively. Uh, you look at uh, the far right parties in Europe these days, they are mostly parroting a Russian foreign policy line. Marine Le Pen in France is basically doing Putin's work for him by essentially promoting Russian foreign policy, idea, policy ideas within France. And she gets a lot of acceptance within France. I would argue that uh, Donald Trump was doing exactly the same thing here. Donald Trump was the perfect useful idiot for Putin, because a lot of his views on foreign policy actually aligned with Russian foreign policy. And so if Russia can get somebody as leader of you know, the government in the United States or leader of the government in France or Britain or whatever, who's essentially willing to support their pol foreign policy platform, that is tremendous, right, for them, from their standpoint. And the problem is we, you know, from a First Amendment standpoint, we can't really sort of silence Donald Trump. Now, you know, the social media platforms kicked them off social media, which I think they had every right to do and I think was a good thing to do. Uh, but uh, Donald Trump has a First Amendment right to speak in a way that Vladimir Putin does not. And so to the extent that uh, Putin is able to use Trump or others like him as useful idiots, that's very helpful for them for advancing their foreign policy agenda. Okay, so the additional layer to the problem that I see is that we've got the external threats, we've got the internal degradation of democratic principles, but the latest issue that, that I noticed um, reported in the BBC last week was that Chinese hackers have now targeted politicians and they used the Australian government as this particular example, and they created a fake news site which mimicked the BBC's, and it was a really good mimic, and they contacted Australian politicians to get their um, re reactions and answers and opinions on things. So they had infiltrated them and hacked them. So this was caught by this proof point, which is a security uh, watchdog in the United States. Um, so this is a third level now of subterfuge going on, rather like um, TikTok, who I think a lot of people here don't realize is uh, has a Chinese parent company and they spent $2.1 million in the second quarter of this year lobbying the US government. That's just one outfit. Um, so I think people should be more aware of the influences are, that are being peddled here to them daily. So maybe public warnings should be posted about the ownership of the site so that for, for national security and public interest, people can, can know who they're actually getting the information from. Is that, is that not possible? Uh, yes, that's definitely possible. 
Uh, let me just back up a second, day, uh, a second though and say, this infiltration by foreign agents is not a new thing. It's been going on for a while, although digital technology definitely makes it easier. Just sort of one example. So the biggest Chinese social media platform is WeChat. And WeChat, I like to say, is like Facebook and Amazon rolled into one because it's not only a social media platform, it's also a shopping platform. And uh, you've got, uh, I can't remember the number now, but something like 300 million WeChat users outside of China, many of whom are ethnically Chinese, and they like to use WeChat to communicate with their family back in China. So one thing that's been going on for several years now is that, uh, that uh, politicians in Western democracies who have large ethnic Chinese constituents uh, use WeChat to communicate with their constituents. And you got big ethnic Chinese communities in Australia and Canada and the United States. And so politicians in these Western liberal democracies are using WeChat to communicate with their constituents. What they don't recognize is China totally controls that platform. And China has used its control over the platform to effectively monitor communications between Western politicians and their constituents and to censor those communications, shut people down who say stuff that they don't like, right? So they are actually able to use the control over that platform to shut down communications between politicians in liberal democracies and their, uh, and their uh, mostly ethnic Chinese constituents. You know, that's just one example, but it's a serious problem. One other example uh, that I mentioned to you before is that this one Chinese media company, uh, China Plus, in one year spent $20 million on lobbying in the United States until this was discovered. They were buying up ad space in both the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and putting in paid ads that didn't look like paid ads. They weren't mm -hmm. identified as sponsored or supported by the uh, Chinese government, right? So, Infomercials. <laughs> uh, right. So at a minimum, yes, I think most First Amendment scholars would agree that there's very little problem with basically having a mandated disclosure requirement that if it's being paid for by the Chinese government, at least there's a warning on there saying it's being paid for by the Chinese government. Same thing with the uh, Russian government. Oh, this, this has been more of a Chinese tactic than a uh, Russian tactic. Uh, the harder thing, as you said, is identifying the covert agents. Uh, my proposal addresses that too, but I think that is a harder problem to address to, to identify the covert agents. Okay, well, we, we set you know that uh, the, one of the first things Putin did when they invaded Ukraine was they shut down all the um, internet access, uh, cell phone access within Ukraine. So it made them really in an information vacuum. Um, so um, that, that was pretty sinister, form of warfare, as well as invading them to shut them off from, uh, from contact. So um, I'm gonna move over to John Pfeffer now. Welcome, John. Uh, John, you spend a lot of your time monitoring what's going in the, on in the world as Director of Foreign Policy at the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, you wrote a very compelling article on Nation of Change website last month, and the title was China Will Decide the Outcome of Russia Versus the West. And I wonder if you would care to share with us the main thrust of the argument, because I think if you ask most people on the street today, in view of the Ukraine situation, the energy problem, they'd say Russia is a much bigger threat to the world order right now than China. Well, yes, I mean, that, that probably is true. Um, in terms of the article, basically, I was arguing that uh, from the point of view of Europeans and Americans, it would seem like there is kind of uh, complete support for sanctions against Russia. There's anger and, and uh, outrage at Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But outside of the West, uh, plus Japan and South Korea, there isn't a lot of support for sanctions. In fact, there's almost no support for sanctions in the global South, if you look at Africa, Latin America. Um, what that means is there are basically three camps. There's the folks who are very much in support of those sanctions. There are those, a very small camp, that are very much against those sanctions. And then there's the fence sitters. And prominent among those fence sitters is China. And how China decides it's going to um, 
get off the fence one way or the other will probably determine not only the outcome of the war in Ukraine, but will determine the future trajectory of the, uh, the of geopolitics more generally. And tell me about how you think they're going to dictate the outcome of the war in Ukraine. I'm interested well, in that. Of course, Russia is counting, and Putin in particular has counted on support from China. It has, you know, touted the very close agreement that uh, Putin has uh, concluded with Xi Jinping. Uh, it expects a very tight uh, degree of cooperation, both military, energy, and economic more generally. But if you actually look at Chinese conduct since the invasion, despite some rhetoric that you know, upholds the agreement with Russia, China has been very careful uh, not to supply Russia with any weapons, uh, not to break any of the sanctions, and to preserve its relationship with both the West and the global economy more generally. In other words, what Putin had hoped for, which was China kind of very vocally and very vigorously supporting its campaign in Ukraine has not happened. Now, what that will mean down the line, hmm, that's hard to say. Uh, one indication of the position that Russia is in, because it has not uh, gotten the Chinese support that it counted on, is these visits uh, that Putin has made not long ago to Iran in order to basically buy drone technology. I mean, that's kind of remarkable. You know, Iran was, you know, purchasing was you know, uh, Russian military hardware not sending Russia uh, its military hardware. And then most recently news that Russia is going to depend on North Korea to supply it with Soviet era ammunition. In other words, uh, the supplier that Russia had counted on, namely China, is not coming through. And so Russia is basically scrambling to uh, get its, its supplies. Now it's not just, of course, the military. Uh, China has in fact supported the war indirectly by buying up a lot of Russian energy, fossil fuels. And it's not necessarily doing that because it wants to support Russia. It's doing that because it needs the energy. Uh, China's economy is growing. Uh, it's sustainable energy, it's wind and solar is growing too, but not at a pace consistent with the increase in use of energy in China. So China needs that energy. Uh, the question really is going forward, how close that energy cooperation is going to be and how closely linked those two economies are going to be. So um, if we look at the tactics that Putin employed in terms of his behavior over say the last 10 years, um, why did he, he up his end game or his tactics after the invasion of Crimea and what is his end game? in terms of, do you see him aligning with China? Um, I mean, they do have a lot in common. They have mutual disdain for America, imperialism and liberalism, um, but they also differ in a lot of ways, yeah, the environment well, being one. Absolutely. And, yeah. and in fact, on this question, you can really see the difference in, in Chinese and Russian behavior because uh, Chinese behavior generally is risk averse. Of course, they take some risks, but if you look over the long haul, Chinese state policy is, is terribly risk averse, both in terms of its, its military approach, but also in terms of uh, its economic um, policy. Putin, on the other hand, well, you can't think of a bigger risk taking uh, adventure, shall we say, than this war in Ukraine. Uh, he really, against the, the advice of military professionals uh, and against what must have been his the assessment of much of the, the think tank foreign policy professionals inside Russia decided to invade Ukraine, uh, not content with simply seizing Crimea and part of the Donbass after 2014. Uh, why did he do this? Well, you know, if you listen to the, the Kremlin, you know, it did this as a kind of preventive war, it kind of in some sense compared its uh, its campaign with the United States invading Iraq. Uh, the United States did so in order to prevent Saddam Hussein, presumably, from acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, and Russia, similarly, was invading Ukraine in order to prevent it from entering NATO eventually. But really, what was Putin after? I mean, if you examine his speeches, what he was really after was a more kind of ethnic nationalist uh, 
effort to unite uh, Russians, Belarusians, and Ukrainians under the kind of rubric of ethnic Russia. Um, and this was you know, part of a longer term strategy of the near abroad, in other, the, other words, the areas just outside the Russian borders where large number, numbers of Russian speakers and ethnic Russians live, an effort by Putin to kind of expand Russian influence in this area, if not to expand actual borders. Now, I hesitate to, to, to add, uh, this is not, you know, a kind of, you know, a, a attempt to rebuild the Soviet Union. Putin is not interested in that. He has a much more ethnically nationalist point of view, point that he's trying to, to, uh, to further here with the invasion of Ukraine. But isn't there a kind of um, mythology built around his idea? You know, he's a sort of Peter the Great. I mean, he's, he seems to be steeped in some, he's gone on some trip, it seems. Um, <laughs> well, there, which, there's definitely an element of that. And certainly the, the ideology of Russia being, you know, Moscow being the third Rome, uh, this has existed in Russian, um, the Ru Russian narrative for hundreds and hundreds of years. So one could say that he is intoxicated by this older narrative, but he is also determined to leave a legacy, a legacy uh, that is not confined to simply, you know, uh, rescuing the Russian economy after the, the dismal years of Yeltsin in the 1990s, not simply a consolidation of the political sphere and a concentration of power in the hands of the presidency, um, but more a kind of ethnic, um, an ethnic ideology. And this really was a change in Putin's perspective after 2013, when he began to speak of Russians, not as Rasiski, namely people who live in Russia, but as Ruski, in other words, people who are ethnic Russians. This was a major shift in his vocabulary and indicated a major shift in his perspective as well. Mm -hmm. So switching back for a moment, um, well, just before we leave uh, Russia and China in terms of differences, what about their energy difference, their policies? I mean, Russia has no kind of eco conscience at all, whereas China has been quite progressive, right, with its clean energy policies. So do you think this is going to shift now because everybody's feeling the pinch, the grain harvests, uh, you know, uh, they've had bad harvests within China. Now they haven't got the, the Ukrainian grain. I mean, do you think this is going to change the way they are conducting their industry and their commitment to cleaner um, energy? Uh, if I well, can, Mary, jump in on that for a second. Yeah. I mean, it's important to recognize China is by far the largest consumer of coal in the world and the largest producer of greenhouse gases in the world. So I don't think you can call them... Uh, progressive on climate, although at the same time they're burning huge amounts of coal and generating huge amounts of greenhouse gases. They are investing a lot in renewable technologies and they are a leader in solar technology. So I don't want to downplay that, but it's important to recognize they also have this and, and they're not getting rid of that coal anytime soon because they need it. Right? Good point. Good point. David is absolutely correct. I mean, the, as I said, the the need for energy inside China has expanded so that even though we've seen what is in fact a remarkable expansion of both solar and wind, 30% uh, increase uh, over last year in wind, 15% in solar, uh, that hasn't meant any decrease in the consumption of fossil fuels. In fact, there's been a slight increase in the consumption of fossil fuels as well. So yes, uh, that is I think, however, China is committed over the long term, especially if we compare it to Russia, committed over the long term to a transformation to some form of a clean energy economy. What the time frame will be? Well, of course, 2050 more or less for carbon neutrality, however you measure that. Russia, Putin more specifically, uh, just before the, the recent COP in Glasgow, had made a commitment for Russia to achieve carbon neutrality in 2060. Um, and there had been some moves, modest though they were, especially at a provincial level, to, uh, to shift over to more sustainable sources of energy. But that's all out the window after the invasion. I mean, frankly, what Putin has done is doubled down on making Russia basically the heart of the fossil fuel economy such that it exists at a global level. And Russia is making huge 
profits basically on the sale of oil and gas after uh, the invasion, um, in part because you know the price is, is lower, uh, it's giving concessionary rates to certain countries. So it's just kind of sending this stuff out, out as quickly as possible. China has aligned itself with Russia to a certain extent. You can see, in fact, some Silk Road or One Belt, One Road uh, investments in Russian energy infrastructure. So for instance, there is a natural gas facility up uh, right in the Arctic Circle, the northernmost natural gas facility in the world. It was built by Russia to supply Europe entirely. 30% of it has been funded by the Chinese. Now, why would the Chinese fund a facility simply to send it all to Europe? Well, because follow-on investments have been on pipelines that can connect that facility to Chinese markets. In other words, even before the war took place, China and Russia were anticipating a, re, a literal reorientation of Russia's energy infrastructure, something that is now accelerating after the invasion of Ukraine, because of course, you know, European, the European market, as far as the Russians are concerned, is, I mean, it exists, but it's, it's not gonna exist for very much longer. Okay, um, that's all uh, very interesting. We've got some questions coming and I want to pose to you, but I wanted to bring back a point that you, you said that you felt Putin helped swing the election for Trump and assisted um, in the rise of nationalism in Europe. Um, you quote a Guardian poll that 44% of respondents in 53 countries rate the US as a greater threat to democracy than either China, 38%, or Russia, 28%. Can we trust these figures? Where did this poll get taken? <laughs> well, I mean, I, as David pointing at, pointed out, uh, the information efforts, efforts to influence uh, foreign elections, foreign mm -hmm. developments, has been going on for a long time. And it's not something that the, the Chinese or the Russians uh, you know, invented. And certainly the United States yeah. has been involved in those as well. And so there are a number of countries where folks feel as if the United States has been the heavy hand uh, affecting their politics more so than China or Russia. Um, whether that perception is accurate or not, well, that's another question which we'd have to address country by country. Um, but in terms of uh, the initial question, which was you know, Putin's impact on uh, the elections here and also in Europe, and as David said, he's written chapters on both of these. Um, this is how I would distinguish between Russia and Chinese um, information warfare, if you will. Putin had a very, very clear idea of how he wanted to disrupt the uh, US elections. He didn't necessarily believe that Putin could win, but he did believe that disruption of and polarization of the electorate in the United States would ultimately redound to his benefit. Similarly, he has done a similar kind of project in Europe where he has supported Euroskeptical uh, formations, parties, movements, uh, most of them on the far right, but some of them on the left, any group that basically thought that the European Union was you know, a, a heavy handed bureaucratic organization and they wanted to pull their country out of uh, the European Union or at least reduce its commitment to the European Union. That's why you know, Putin and Viktor Orban get on so famously, Orban in Hungary, of course. It's why Putin was so you know, supportive of the Brexit movement in the UK. It's why he provided some limited financial support for Marine Le Pen in France. Uh, but all of which is designed to basically advance Russia's uh, position with respect to Europe and the United States. China, yes, and heavily invested in information warfare. Has China been involved in disrupting US elections? No. European elections? Not really. Uh, Australian elections, a little bit. I mean, China, for the most part, is mostly focused in terms of those operations in its own uh, neck of the woods. And of course, it's very interested in controlling uh, the information space within China itself. So I think there are some, some important distinctions between how Russia and China approach information warfare. Let me just add, there's a, there's a great quote from somebody who used to work in the National Security Council talking about this, that uh, uh, Russia is a hurricane and China is climate change. 
Uh, Russia's approach to this whole thing is very negative and destructive, right? They wanted to undermine NATO. They wanted to undermine the European Union. They wanted, as John said, to sort of undermine democracy in the United States. Like a hurricane, Russia is a very destructive force, right? China has a much more sort of long-term vision, you know, like climate change is willing to be sort of slow and patient and methodical in sort of gradually transforming the international order in a direction that is more to its liking, right? And just one, uh, one example of how China goes and approaches this, there's a Chinese company uh, that is effectively the, I think it's Star Times is the name, it's the effectively the Comcast of Africa. They have more, uh, you know, control over cable channels in Africa than any other uh, than any other country, and you know they they uh, one of the things that they do is they have this whole offering. You want to get, you know. BBC on cable, you can get that. You want to get Al Jazeera on cable, you can get that. But they package it in a way that the Chinese television networks come in for free, right? The, you want BBC, you got to pay extra for that, right? So a whole lot of people in Africa who don't have a whole lot of money are getting their news from Chinese sources because, hey, that's part of their cable package. They can get that and they don't have to pay extra for it. If they want BBC, though, they got to pay for that. If they want Al, Jaze Al Jazeera, they got to pay for that. So China is in influencing the information environment all over Africa. And that's partly why you look at sort of public opinion polling from Africa. It's the African countries that are more favorable towards China than almost anywhere else in the world. So that's, that's a good point. Um, so that poll that you, qu you quoted, John, the Guardian poll, where, where, what, how did they do that in 53 countries? <laughs> I, I, I don't mean, really know the, the mechanism by which they uh, yeah, it, they get it that. Sounds but, a bit bogus, doesn't but it? But remember that you know the especially during the Trump years, uh, the United States did not have a sterling reputation in terms of its uh, uh, democracy promotion. Uh, but but even let's take the question of democracy promotion. Now, of course, I support democracy. I, I promote democracy, if you will. But all, not everything that falls under the category of democracy promotion is necessarily, well, certainly not received as benign in the countries that are uh, receiving that <laughs> promotion of democracy. And for a lot of countries, they perceive it as a uh, violation of their sovereignty. In other words, um, you know, North Korea, for instance, and I'm not defending North Korea here, but certainly North Korea sees, you know, the, the National Endowment of Democracy's funding of radio stations and, uh, and other social media efforts at effectively kind of undermining the North Korean regime as a threat to, to the government. Um, now, there are other examples of, uh, of cases in which the United States has not really respected other countries' sovereignty in this respect. And if you flip it over, we were not happy when our sovereignty was affected by Russian manipulation of our election. So um, you can see why uh, there would be considerable um, unhappiness uh, among people around the world with US conduct, uh, whether it was you know, anti-democratic under Trump or even pro-democratic before Trump and after Trump. Although I will, I will add that, uh, that I'd be curious to see when the poll was taken because there was definitely a change in perceptions of the United States in the transition from Trump to Biden. Uh, but John is certainly right that, you know, you, you, we've done a lot going back decades to intervene in other countries uh, in ways that they legitimately claim are interference with their, you know, sovereign sphere, right? Okay, so let's um, try and think about how we might solve this problem. So part of the problem is somebody's asked, can we not cut off Russia or China from the global internet? <laughs> um, we cannot cut them off from the global internet. Uh, I mean, China has cut itself off from the global internet to some extent by building the so-called Great Firewall of China. And Russia has... Uh, done something similar just since the invasion of Ukraine. I mean, before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia, Russian information space was a lot more open to uh, right. outside penetration. 
but uh, but you know they are connected to the global internet, and that's not going to be uh, shut down. Now, what I think we can do is uh, get Chinese and Russian state agents off of social media platforms. I think that would be a good thing to do. That would be a helpful step. Would be a positive step to make it work. You really need cooperation among liberal democracies. So in the second half of the book, I propose what I call a, an alliance for democracy, which would bring together about 35 or 40 states that are the leading liberal democracies in the world to come up with a sort of a common solution for regulating social media. It would have to be implemented domestically in each country would sort of you know, adopt its own domestic regulations. But what I'm aiming for is what international lawyers talk about as regulatory harmonization, where we get very similar regulations in all of these different countries. And I think this could be uh, an effective technique for basically keeping Chinese and Russian state agents off of social media platforms, that's not going to prevent them from spreading propaganda in lots of other ways. It's not going to prevent them from carrying out misinformation campaigns in other ways, but it could severely limit their ability to use social media for that purpose. And I think that would be a uh, positive and a useful step. Right. But we got to remember that the Internet is a lot bigger than just social media. Uh, and I don't think we want to sort of cut them off of the Internet altogether. I don't think that would be a good thing. And we should remember that, you know, it's it's these are huge entities that contain, you know, a, a multitude of perspectives. Russia less so, obviously, uh, uh, in the latter stages of Putin's reign, uh, but still in China, a variety of different perspectives. Um, there was an agreement uh, between Obama and Xi near the end of Obama's uh, presidency, uh, kind of an informal agreement, but one that was effective in uh, reducing the basically state hacking um, or hackers that were engaged in, in information warfare. And you saw a, a significant reduction in the amount of Chinese infiltrations. And many of those were corporate, of course, efforts to steal uh, corporate secrets. In other words, I do think that there's, again, a, diff a distinction here between Russia and China in terms of, of policy options. I think we can, we can sit down with the Chinese and get some agreements uh, that, that don't, won't eliminate information warfare, but could reduce it. At the moment, unfortunately, there's not a lot of opportunities to sit down with Russia to talk about anything, um, but maybe at some point in the future, we can have that, that conversation. Um, I think that's one issue, the external problem. I think we've got a much bigger problem internally in the United States with the non-professionalism of journalism, uh, where people no longer know what they're reading as an opinion, or if it's someone on a rant, um, if it's some hyperbole. Um, I feel there's got to be a lot more fact-checking, clear fact-checking alongside an article. Like, for example, I read the two speeches, last speeches that Truss and the other guy uh, running for the Prime Minister of, uh, of England. Um, yeah. yeah, and um, right through the whole speeches of what they were proposing and what they did, there was fact checks. The BBC were putting alongside not true, exaggerated, 20% more. So you could see, you know, truth next to opinion or hyperbole. And I feel that's really lacking here. And I don't know why, but the press is losing ground um, because there's been too much lobbying to, to control free information, uh, trustworthy information. And just this last week, uh, two reporters from CNN Brian Selter and the White House correspondent John Harwood were fired um, for giving speeches um, online on television. One said Trump was a dishonest demagogue. Well, that's actually true. It might be an opinion, but it's true. Robert Reich wrote a great piece in The Guardian saying decent reporting is not violating journalistic standards. It's telling the unvarnished truth about what's happening in America today and balanced journalism doesn't exist halfway between fact and lies. And I think we've got to start really being thorough about this stuff and calling people on lies as lies, not virtual alternative truth, 
uh, all these other acronym, uh, the, the, these pseudonyms we've come up with uh, for, for somebody just telling downright lies to the American public. And I think people are feeding that as information now in their little silo, on their phone, and it's, in, it's not connected to the real world. Um, that worries me more, perhaps, even than China and Russia. I don't know what you think. Well, Mary, let me give a little bit of like mm. historical context here, if I may. So yeah. for a period of about 40 years, the Federal Communications Commission, which has the authority to regulate both television and radio, uh, applied a doctrine that they called the Fairness Doctrine. The Fairness Doctrine had different elements to it, but our core idea was, you know, as a journalist, as a broadcaster on either side, didn't apply to newspapers, but television, radio broadcasters, if they presented one side, they had to present the other side too. And that meant that, you know, when we turned on the radio or we turned on the television, we got at least an effort at balanced reporting, right? Um, the, uh, under the Reagan administration in the late 80s, the Federal Communications Commission abolished the Fairness Doctrine. Um, interestingly, there was a Supreme Court decision from the late 1960s that said this Fairness Doctrine is constitutional. It doesn't violate the First Amendment. But the Federal Communications Commission in the 1980s says we think, it, we think it does violate the First Amendment, and so we're getting rid of it. And the Supreme Court allowed that decision to stand. And basically, it's right after the Supreme Court abolishes the Fairness Doctrine that Rush Limbaugh takes off, right? And Rush Limbaugh is really the model for, uh, you know, right-wing political commentary masquerading as journalism. And then, you know, a little while after Rush Limbaugh, we get, uh, we get Fox News. And we've now got a situation, uh, there's an excellent book by a group of scholars at Harvard called Network Propaganda. And what they show with sort of detailed empirical analysis is that we've essentially got two different media systems in the United States today. We've got what they call a right-wing media ecosystem, which about 30 to 35% of the American public is getting most of its news and information from this right-wing media ecosystem. And the journalists who occupy that system have essentially abandoned traditional journalistic ethics. They're not interested in being neutral. They're not interested in being objective. They're not interested in really at getting at the facts. What they wanna do is present a particular political viewpoint. And then you've got the mainstream media where people, I think, really do care about the facts, really do care about objectivity, and they're trying to do a good job to sort of report the facts. But those two different media ecosystems don't talk to each other. The people who are inhabiting the right-wing media ecosystem, that's what they hear, that's what they see, that's what they learn, right? So it's very hard for people who are trying to uh, get at the facts to sort of get those facts before people who are getting their news and information from uh, this right-wing media ecosystem. Now, the other point I'll say about that is I did actually come up with a pretty detailed statutory proposal to create what I call a national endowment for fact-checking. So I agree with you that we need to do a lot more for fact-checking, and I think there are ways that we can do a much better job with fact-checking uh, without censorship and without violating uh, the First Amendment. Those, I think point. those are very good suggestions, and I appreciate the history that you provided, David. Um, on top of that, I would, I would add that in the social media universe, you know, what they took out of uh, the, the history of Limbaugh and the creation of this right-wing eco-sphere was that polarizing content was far more popular uh, on Facebook than, you know, just the facts. Just the facts, you might get, you know, some interest, but really polarizing content would get people to click. And that has been a, a real driver, I think, of uh, some of the polarization of, of uh, opinion in this country, um, especially as people you know, have gravitated away from the newspapers and from television to get their news or news <laughs> from social media. Um, and so how do we uh, address that? How do we come up with um, policy recommendations that would transform the social media sphere away from 
this kind of polarizing content? I, that's a very challenging question. It is a well, very, it's very worrisome when, when people like CNN are firing two really good journalists, one of whom was the White House correspondent. That's not a radical network. CNN, you know, is in hotels around the world. Uh, so if they're being put out to pasture um, for just saying, speaking truth to power, it, it makes you wonder, do you have to look at who owns everything um, in order to see what the color of the opinion being voiced is? And I think that's probably true, right? At the end of the day. Right. Well, that's, you know, there's, there are <clears throat> definitely proposals out there saying that uh, we can sort of use antitrust law as one tool to deal with this. This is part of what Elizabeth Warren is pushing is if, if you sort of, you know, break up monopolies of ownership in the, uh, you know, uh, the big media companies, media. Uh, mm -hmm. you could mm -hmm. uh, get a healthier sort of uh, mm -hmm. media ecosystem. I don't know whether that'll work, but I think, you know, I I agree with you that there, there is uh, there's actually good documented evidence that shows in the current media environment, lies spread, spread faster than truth. And that is a real problem. And I don't have a sort of a magic bullet solution to the problem, but I think we need to consider different creative alternatives to get at that because uh, because it's a serious issue. Well, we need to get a lot better at it. I think the liberal, um, fair-minded <laughs> people are not as rabid as the people that are working in the opposition to truth. And unfortunately, I think we've got to, I wouldn't say take on their tactics, but I think we've got to get a much more um, active role in preserving democracy and calling this stuff out for what it is. If it's propaganda or hyperbole, then we say it's hyperbole or its opinion. It doesn't make it true or a fact. And I think that's what we've lost, that differentiation. Uh, somebody once said that, you know, that that was what was so great about old school journalism before the internet, that you were, your job was on the line if you got it wrong. <laughs> Nobody's job's on the line when they sound off on the internet. They just say what they like and then say, oh, I was just saying, you know, then it's couched in, oh, well, <laughs> it suddenly wasn't really serious. It was just me saying whatever that is. Um, and, and I think we've got to go back and be a lot stricter about standards. Anyway, um, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, somebody's written something here. I'm not quite sure what the question means. Uh, isn't being terribly divided our worst weakness to outside interference? What can be done to address the great divide? Yeah, I mean, I do think that, you know, the polarization in the, in the United States these days is as bad as it's been for a long, long time. It does uh, weaken us both internally and externally, right? It's hard, to, it's hard to get democracy to work properly when we're so divided internally. And it makes it easier for external adversaries to sort of exploit those divisions uh, to intervene in our politics, right? So I do think that uh, one piece of it is uh, really involves fixing the uh, broken media ecosystem and trying to create a me media ecosystem in which, you know, truth prevails over lies in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, and that's not easy to do, but I think as long as, you know, we've got one group of people who are getting their so-called facts from one set of sources and a different group of people who are getting their facts from a different set of sources, it's hard to figure out how we sort of come together as a nation to work together on solving problems. I mean, there's very interesting polling data out recently that shows that one thing Democrats and Republicans actually agree on a lot to a surprising degree is that our democratic system is currently dysfunctional. Uh, they just have very different ideas about who's to blame for the problem, right? Uh, but, but there's actually broad agreement along partisan lines that that's a problem. So, uh, so I think there's interest in solving that problem, although coming up with solutions is not easy. I, I would agree with that, although I, I would also say that, you know, the, the reasons for polarization go beyond you know, uh, disagreements over facts versus opinions, that here in this country, our polarization 
has been uh, accentuated by anger over haves, between haves and have nots, those who have benefited from economic reforms and those who have not benefited, as well as anger at political elites for having associated themselves with economic reforms that have benefited a minority. And unfortunately, a lot of that anger at elites spills over into anger at journalists who are perceived as being mm-hmm. part of the, of the elite as well. So I really think that, yes, we can reform our media, we can reform social media, but ultimately we have to look at more equitable economic policies and more participatory political uh, mechanisms in order to really bridge this, this gap. A gap, by the way, here in the United States, which we can find in other countries as well. We're not unique in having a polarized uh, population. Now, I mean, just a, a, just a, a really simple thing struck me. And, and of course, nobody has acted upon this, but if, if, for example, somebody is running for office currently and they say that the vote was stolen, that they're promulgating that myth, I'd say you're out. You, you can't run for office. Clearly you don't support the system, the democracy that we uphold, you don't believe in, you can't run for office. Aim at, that would be the end of it. To me, that is a very straightforward, direct intervention you can do right away to eliminate all these uh, you know, conspiracy theorists from even running for office, right? Well, under current First Amendment doctrine, I think that that would be unconstitutional. Now, I- but if, you're, not- if you're saying the election was stolen, what are you saying? What are you saying? What are you saying politically? Uh, I mean, I think that that the under current First Amendment doctrine that is protected speech, government can't stop you from saying that. Now, I think there's problems with the court's First Amendment doctrine, but I think if, for, I mean, first of all, you're not going to get agreement to pass that, you know, pass a law like that. But even if you did get an agreement to pass a law like that, unfortunately, it would be struck down. You don't have to pass a law. When you stand up and say, I uphold the Constitution of the United States and you swear an oath, you either do or you don't. That's simple. If you say the election was stolen, you're not in. You can't run. But Mary, that, that's, this, that's this last election. One can imagine a situation in which, you know, in a future election, the election is indeed, well, stolen, okay. if you will. By I'm saying party. currently now <laughs> to stop the rot, that would be one small intervention right now it would get rid of that whole election was stolen it, was, eliminate it from the forefront and get on with the next election you know i i just think things like this should be nipped in the bud and every time we get to something everybody backs off the courts back off i don't know what it is everyone seems frightfully fearful of trump and his cronies and it has to be stopped or this democracy really is going to fall apart so end of rant <laughs> I'm sure it's illegal, but I don't know what the answer is otherwise. Um, if you can't speak the truth and you can't say these things, you're playing games, you're playing politics, you're not doing politics. But, you know, we obviously we, we, we all hope for a Frank Capra-like ending to this in which people rise <laughs> up and, you know, and assert their democratic rights. And I, I'm not sure we're going to get a Frank Capra ending, but we do have examples recently in New Hampshire of a group of people in a small town who had seen their school budget slashed basically to, to near, well, in half, but near zero effectively who then figured out a way that they could reverse that in a democratic fashion. And I think ultimately that's what we have to do. We have to figure out what democratic mechanisms we have at our disposal to nip these in the bud. I don't think we can do an end run around those because those, uh, an end run will ultimately come back and bite us in the butt at some point in the future. Um, and you know, strengthening our democratic institutions uh, strengthening our democratic participation, I think ultimately that will be the way to to address tyrannical movements like Trump's movement. Yeah, and I, I actually do believe that at some point uh, the Republican Party is going to ditch Trump and you will get a rebirth of a more sort of moderate centrist uh, Republican Party. Uh, and You know, one thing that may lead us in that direction is the Republicans, it's looking like they're going to do a whole lot worse in the midterms than people were talking about a few months ago. And one piece of that is that they're 
putting up candidates who are just too extreme for the mainstream electorate. You know, so so at some point the message is going to get through. You put up these sort of radical extremists, and you're going to lose elections. You want to win elections, you got to actually put forward some more moderate centrist candidates. So we'll see what happens. But I do think that that is what, at least a piece. You know, that's not the entire path back, but that's a piece of it. And I don't think there's one solution here. I think there's a lot of different little things. And I agree fully with John that like strengthening democratic institutions, finding ways to make democracy work better. I mean, one of the problems is that a lot of the American public just does not have faith in democracy right now. A lot of skepticism about whether democratic government really works. And we have a lot of work to do to persuade people that democratic government really does work and can deliver the goods. And as John said, part of that is economically, right? That we've got this growing inequality in the country, which makes a whole lot of people very unhappy and with good reason. Well, I think you've covered an awful lot of really good ground today. Um, I'm really very grateful to both of you for your time and for writing your books and doing the work that you do. And hopefully you'll inspire some citizens to, to act. That's one of the questions we got, what can citizens do? So I think you gave some good suggestions there. So thank you, David Sloss and John Pfeffer for all your input and insights today. Um, Cambridge Forum is made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, the Mass Cultural Council and Cambridge Community Foundation, and of course you. And thank you all so very much for joining us. See you again soon.